Hi, my name is Megan Motley and I'm the owner of Goodness Gracious Cookies. What made me get up the courage to call Operation Hope was because I knew that my small business needed help in some key areas. I didn't want my business to just look good on the outside, but on the inside it was falling apart because there were intricate pieces that were missing. Um, there were things that I didn't have in place to protect my business. And I just decided I've got to make some changes in my business. And also the people on staff with Operation Hope um, were just so warm and welcoming and my teacher, Miss Trudy, just super amazing, super sweet, um, embraced me and, and made me feel comfortable that I had gotten up the courage to say, hey, I need help. And um, they were able to help me every step of the way. And I'm so glad that I stepped up and decided to, to reach out to Operation Hope. The biggest weight lifted off of me now that I'm on a path for financial well-being is just knowing that I am equipped. Um, knowing that I have the knowledge to improve in the area of my personal credit, knowing that I have the tools that I need to grow my business, also knowing that I have access to the amazing team at Operation Hope from Ms. Trudy to all the people that make up the staff of Operation Hope. Um, just being connected to um, other business owners who I went through the class with, who they're also doing amazing things. So the biggest weight is just knowing that I have the knowledge, I have these amazing tools, and I would encourage anyone that's a small business owner, whether you are just starting, um, whether you've been in business for a while like I was, I encourage anyone to check out Operation Hope and get started whenever the next program is starting because it is an absolutely amazing program. I will forever be grateful to Operation Hope. Welcome back, everybody. We're so delighted that you have spent this day with us. We are rounding out the morning, and we've had some really interesting and informative conversations, and this next one will be exactly the same. We all know that there are two international languages, music and sports, and we've got some extraordinary icons from both of those areas, and we've got some business thrown in the mix. So let me introduce you to the folks that are going to be with us. I'm going to start out with Tony Ressler, who co-founded the private equity firms Apollo Global Management and Eris Management. I know Tony, though, not through the business side, but through the NBA. He's also the principal owner and chair of the board of the Atlanta Hawks. Thank you, Tony, for being here. We're so excited. We also have shortly coming with us will be T.I. from Atlanta. We all know T.I. who started rapping when he was nine years old and later signed his own record deal in 1999. He has become an entrepreneur and a businessman, starting his own record label, Grand Hustle Records. He's currently out with his 11th studio album, the L-I-B-R-A, the Libra. So excited about that. We also have Michael Renter in the house. Now, those of you might not know who that is, so let me break it down for you. Have you heard of Killer Mike? It's that dude. We love him here in Atlanta, a rapper, songwriter, actor, actor and activist. We are delighted to have him in studio with us. You might recall he has recently launched a digital banking platform called Greenwood. Their mission is to serve the black, Latinx and other underserved communities that have historically struggled to gain access to capital. So thank you, Mike, for what you've done and what you continue to do. Last but certainly not least, I got someone really exciting that's going to talk with all these gentlemen. My sister from another mister, Stephanie Rule. We all know she's the senior business correspondent for NBC News and anchors MSNBC Live with Stephanie Rule. I'm a fangirl, so yes, I see her every morning at 9 a.m. She previously served as an anchor and managing editor for Bloomberg Television following her tenure as a managing director at Deutsche Bank. Now, if this is not a group, we don't know what is. I'm going to throw it over to you, Stephanie. Go, girl. 
Thank you so, so much. Uh, I know T.I. is joining us in a sec. Mike, welcome. Thank Tony, you. welcome. Um, no better time than the present, Tony, to put the white rich guy on the spot. So how about we start with you? Um, in the last few weeks, we know that there was a bank CEO that got a huge amount of criticism because made, he made comments around the fact that black people aren't getting the most senior positions in his organization because he just couldn't find them. And there was a lot of outrage about that, and it's justified. But it's not just about the jobs on the top. We keep, we keep misdiagnosing that. You have to go back in time. There's not people in positions to get those big jobs because they're not mid-level positions or entry-level positions. And you have to go further back than that. It's the basics around money and banking, right? Money is that other international language. And we know that 17% of black households don't even have bank accounts, as opposed to 3% of white families. We know that for black small businesses, it's twice as hard for them to get funding. So this isn't just about why don't we see more black faces on top of corporate America. It goes all the way back to the beginning of financial education and opportunity equality. So given your career, your philanthropy, your vantage point, how do we start to solve from this at the bottom? Well, I think we have to start to solve for this from the bottom, the middle, the top. Uh, so please understand, uh, there are so many issues we could talk about, uh, but if we're talking about the private sector and what the private can do, must do, should do, you know, as far as I'm concerned, every company in America, every industry in America should have a plan on how they can become more diverse, how they can have a more diverse employee base, how they can help provide capital more attractively communities of color. This is all uh, under the category of both good business and the right thing to do. So please understand if a company, uh, it's not going to change overnight, but if you're not going to commit yourself to having a plan to become a more diverse business, and then I would argue a better business as a result, we're not going to make real change. And it's not just the private sector that I like to argue. It's the private sector and the public sector that have to work together. The public sector has to do its fair share, whether it's passing a CARES Act, whether it's raising minimum wage, whether it's providing subsidized health care, um, what I call Medicare for the poor, wh whether uh, generally, truly, whether it's providing K-12 education. There are all things the public sector can be doing. But what's most important is that the private sector doesn't just rely on the public sector. That every company and industry, as I say, have a plan to become more diverse. Have methods by which capital becomes more attractive to communities of color, to entrepreneurs like Killer Mike. Can people access capital attractively and can they use it effectively? The private sector can help in that and should. Uh, I, I want to give you guys the heads up. Um, my lip reading skills are not great, and I can't hear Tony speaking, so hopefully our audience did. Um, Michael, I want to turn to you. Um, you have been a prominent voice in music, social justice, and activism for years. And when George Floyd was killed and you were speaking in Atlanta, you talked about people needing to activate and create positive change. We assumed you were talking about social justice, criminal justice reform, but you're actually taking action in the banking and finance world. Can you speak to that and explain to our audience what you're doing? Absolutely. Just making sure, like kindergarten class, everybody that can hear me raise their hand, because I heard Tony. Okay, I can cool. hear you. So I, I, wanna, I hear Mike. That, that, that statement that you asked me um, is based in a philosophy I have of plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. And I learned that working in the 501c3 world in the world of organizing, where I learned that philosophy and made it my own. Um, under a woman named Alice Johnson and Reverend James Orange, formerly organized with SELC with Andrew Young and Martin. And people tend to think of social organizing only as a thing of, of society and social and political issues and things. They tend not to understand that in Martin's last years, his final two years, he talked about ending poverty, talked about um, leveling up economically an underserved community, blacks who had been basically locked out of being able to be capitalists in this system or being able to practice any type of effective capitalism past the communities they were locked in. He understood how that um, shrinking 
also shrank greater society, stopped people from involving with one another. Um, so Tony and what he was saying is absolutely right. You have to attack this problem on every single level. I would challenge the Wells Fargo CEO to adopt three classes in Atlanta and kindergarten and walk those kids through the next 13 years of school, specifically focusing on them and their families, financial literacy, intent on graduating his next year. I would also challenge him to do much like Brother Robert um, Smith did and underwrite a class at Morehouse or Clark or help to restore Morris Brown, specifically targeting building financiers. And then I'd pick. I cherry pick from other companies that are successful. This is a capitalist society. I go to black banks that are successful, look at the people running them, and figure out a way to do business with them in order to strengthen their bank and take some diversity in my own organization. That's something that he's true to because this is the conversation we have on a biweekly basis when I call him for mentorship. I think that what we have lacked is the opportunity in this country due to racism, segregation, redlining, things of that nature. I think Tony is exactly right. Michael V. Smith are exactly right when they say that the private sector has a responsibility to be accountable, not only for philanthropic reasons, but what it does is you grow more talent. Football invests in country southern towns because that's where their talent comes from. Baseball invests in the Caribbean because that's where their talent comes from. And if we don't start to understand financially, if the private sector is not investing in this huge talent pool of young black kids who want to be in the finance, who want to be entrepreneurs, any kid who's cut grass wants to master money. And we can start to help people be financially literate as young as kindergarten. We can start helping kids understand that all, every, although everyone won't be LeBron, you can be his right-hand man and handle his money and his business deals. And we can be mentored by people like Tony and by corporations as, as a community. And if we take that responsibility to work in unison, no matter what sex, creed, color we are, not only does it help my community become financially stable, it helps the greater community. Because in capitalism, where you have more competition, usually it serves the customer better. Uh, well, the way capitalism should work best, Tony, is if we have more players competing in the game. Instead of, and I apologize if you said any of this before, I wasn't able to hear you. Does it not make more business sense to address this? You know, when Mike was talking about sports, it makes me think of the sport of lacrosse. There is no correlation between being good at lacrosse and pursuing and succeeding in a career on Wall Street. But you know what there is? An extraordinary network. That sport happens to know a lot of guys who work in banking. And those guys in banking introduce them. Because banking, finance, is a different language. And if you never know that language, you can never play the game. Does it not behoove a truly capitalist society to say, we need to teach more people this language so we can get the best players in the game? So uh, I'm thrilled to repeat myself, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and to, but, Sorry. Uh, no, no. So please understand that the truth of the matter is every company, every industry that can grow its employee base to be more diverse, but to position them for success, you know, rather than criticize whatever the banker at Wells Fargo was trying to, uh, to communicate, clearly not as effectively as maybe he wished, you know, every industry, the investment industry, the asset management industry, is working with, certainly my company and others, working with HBCUs to help with curriculum that the kids at school today, uh, no disrespect to Killer Mike and go into third grade, which is great. I want to see K-12 education improve. But we could go to HBCUs today, help with curriculum to make sure that the students in HBCUs are better prepared for success asset management business by just helping in curriculum and folks that have had that experience because just as you correctly point out there there aren't enough people of color in the finance industry in the asset management industry and when that changes so will the roles in mid-level and senior change but it has to start somewhere and creating more diversity in virtually every significant business Banking and finance, top of the list, should be happening, should have been happening years ago, of course, and it has been happening to a degree, but not nearly to the degree requires. And, and, and I, that's I, our I, job. And you know, and I, I don't want to pick on the Wells Fargo CEO, and I remember when he said it, it drew huge criticism 
but but there's sort of this ugly truth on the surface that at some level he could say i look at the numbers and maybe he has a point there aren't people eligible for those top jobs which is why you need to solve for it at, at a at a much more base level mike how much do you attribute this to simply not knowing the language, not knowing the language of money or investing or raising money. Well, let me let Tony know we were definitely in agreement on the HBCUs, which is why I brought up Robert Smith. So private sector, it's a bunch of kids in from, from Alabama to Tuskegee to Morehouse and Clark that need you. So come on, swoop in with those curriculums that are going to help teach the kids those money. So I agreed with him from the beginning. I agree now. We can start at basement, middle, and top level. So what I would say to him is, you know, unlike everyone else, I don't care to see him nailed to the cross as much. I'd rather see him come out of that moment having learned something and saying, well, this is what's actionable and this is what we're going to do. I don't know the language. A lot of times I'll wake up in the morning, my wife, um, Shana, who's tremendously smarter than me with a coin, um, will, will say something or an idea and I'll have to call Tony at nine in the morning. And remember, it's six in LA. Maybe you should call a little later and says, hey, I'm going to get this much money. My instinct says, I make enough money yearly, okay, we don't want anything extra. Maybe I should put that away and focus on not, not pulling and buying a new Lamborghini or Ferrari. And he'll say, gut-wise, your wife's instincts are right, and here's why. This is how you grow and compound interest. This is what you do versus simply paying 45% of your taxes. So I'm learning, but I'm learning a new language. So her instincts that are just base raw minimum, she was raised by a woman who ran a shot house. So she thinks a coin very differently, very differently than I do. Her gut instincts are right, and he has taught us the language. I think if that happens in school before grad school, if it happens freshman year, if it happens senior year going into freshman year, you come out in four or five years with the population that's financially literate, ready to teach that to their, 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 their family members as they go along. But beyond that, they're ready to enter the banking sector. They're ready to enter the finance sector in a way that's going to individually grow them and grow their money in their communities of color. Uh, Tony, from a philanthropic standpoint, I know I'm going off on a, a limb a little bit here. You've done a ton over the course of your life in terms of education. How much does that base education not just a, not just a financial education but a strong education give the next generation of of kids the foundation to pull themselves to move up from a socioeconomic standpoint a quality k-12 education access to affordable college or career studies is critically important and everyone knows it the question is how do you improve k-12 education but just one example to Mike's point, why isn't 12th grade, every high school senior should graduate with finance under his or her belt that says, here's how I open a checking account, here's how I take out a small business loan, this is the importance of compounding yeah. in my investment account. No one takes and is required to take finance as a senior in high school and comes out and doesn't know how to take a car loan or open a checking account. What am I missing? Black, what, white, what are, why is it that way? Why is it that way? Why did I take calculus in high school and I don't know how to do my taxes? Because we're trying to I grow rocket scientists or, or production workers versus growing people who really want to participate or have the ability to participate in this country's economy. And I think that we need to radically change schools in that way. But that's my opinion. I'm going to let Tony give his. I just interjected there. <laughs> And I hate, uh, on this issue, we are a thousand percent in agreement. Listen, Bill Gates passed and funded, from what I understand, trying to put science math in high school across this country, in curriculums across high school. I, I salute that. I, I, I welcome that. But basic finance that says when you come out of high school, you know how to buy a house with a home mortgage, uh, open a checking account, you know the power of compounding, you know the difference between a stock and a bond. This is critically important for this country. It's critically important for people of color coming out of high school. It's critically important for white people. It's critically important for Asian people. But the, the, the reason this doesn't could be more complicated than they're willing to discuss today, but that curriculum should and could change, but it's all part of sending the message that frankly, folks like 
Mike are far more influential than folks like me, which is we have to introduce basic financial literacy across this country, and it will help people better themselves, and the private sector and the public sector should be teaming up to do just that, and people with real voices should be using them. Absolutely. But Tony, I, I think that's maybe the most important point. While Mike has tremendous impact and influence, it's the partnership with people in your position that are really going to get us to the next level. Michael, how do you look at, right? So, so nine months ago before COVID hit, we may have been missing the boat on some of our economic vulnerabilities because it was a huge quote unquote win for our economy that the unemployment number was so low, yeah. that black unemployment had made such great strides. Yeah. But a job doesn't mean it's a job that can support you. Because all of a sudden COVID hit and we saw it disproportionately hit black and brown communities. Yes. And even many people that had a job didn't have enough to support themselves. Yes. So having a job, isn't that putting uh, scotch tape on a much bigger gaping hole problem? Absolutely. Considering or looking at it like, well, at least you got a job is not the good enough. The, 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 at a certain point, the goal shouldn't be to cure cancer. It should be to prevent cancer. But since we're living with cancer, we have to admit that at one point, a hundred and something days ago, 200 and something days ago, it had gotten better and my community got a glimpse of some stability. But the truth is we have never been stable. We were not stable during times of slavery because we were used as economic commerce. We were not stable for the years after Reconstruction because we were destabilized by things like Jim Crow, redlining, the promise of GI bills that never came, um, underfunded neighborhoods. So we've never had true stability. So I think that rather than argue the points of was it better with lower unemployment or better now, it begins for me to say, well, what can we do right now as a form of triage to stop the bleeding and do what we can in the maximum to correct that. And in the very maximum, what we can do is start a campaign, if nothing else, to start basic financial literacy. I didn't join Greenwood, the bank, just because I thought America needed another bank. I knew that there were special problems on Martin Luther King, a couple streets up from where I grew, a couple streets up from where T.I. grew up. There were special problems there. We saw banks move brick and mortar locations. We saw liquor stores and check cashing places come in. We saw families that were moving with $200 a week all of a sudden have 160 because they were being charged 20% on a dollar in cash checks. So my thing was if there's a digital platform that will provide an opportunity for people to keep all their money so that instead of spending that $40 simply to cash, they can now save 20, they can put 20 in a long-term saving, they can save 20 for their Christmas or whatever. That is the beginning. And I say that because I'm not being idealistic. I'm not a rich rapper that's always been rich as this has happened. I grew up a poor and working class kid from three streets from Martin Luther King. I grow up there. My grandparents, who grew up on pennies in the very rural South, managed to save enough money to buy one rental property that helped subsidize raising my sisters and I. Now, that's not the old American dream of MTV Cribs, but that is the very real American dream of we are at the start of wealth for our community. Black people are only 57 years free. And the generation that's my age, that's in mid-40s and mid-30s up to mid-50s, are going to have to start seeing ourselves as a foundational cornerstone for our grandchildren versus saying, I want it all now. We're not going to get it all now. If you are fortunate enough to make hundreds of thousands, a million dollars, or to, make, or to gain any asset to leave to your children and their children, you should not only be learning about financial literacy at base level, you should be learning what a trust is. Because I knew at 24 I was too stupid to keep anything my grandparents left me, so thank God they waited till I was in my 30s before they died. Because if I would have been 24, I would have just sold my grandma's house which is now worth triple the value, and my sister lives in it, and can now pull out equity and make sure her son has a better education. But I didn't know that because I didn't know that from school. I knew that because two old people who were burly with money raised me. So I think that on a very base level, people who look like me, people who are my age, can start taking the self-accountability of learning to be financially literate. We can start making sure our children are, and from the public and private sector, we need allies and we need people investing in us and investing in our communities so that we can start to generationally grow in the way that America has promised and given every other group, but we have only had 57 years of a peek into it. 
Michael was blessed with grandparents who were focused on wealth creation, even if it wasn't a great deal of wealth. T.I., to Michael's point, we need to make sure that next generation is financially literate. How do we do that if we are not? How do we start to turn the page and not just ensure that people have jobs, but that they understand wealth creation, real estate, uh, owning your own real estate, starting to, to, to in, being an investor doesn't mean that you're wealthy. It means that you're building a foundation. How do we start getting the African community there? Um, well, I think that, uh, that I, I, I believe there are three things that plague our communities that kind of keep us downtrodden, um, especially financially. That's the, the lack of education, uh, the lack of opportunities, and the lack of exposure. Okay, now we have substandard education in our public school systems uh, versus the public school systems that are available to our Caucasian neighbors across town in Buckhead rather than Bankhead where I grew up. Uh, we have much less opportunity to go around to all of the people within the community of Bankhead uh, than our Caucasian neighbors have in Buckhead and much, much less exposure uh, to create ambition and vision for for the future of tomorrow for our children uh, on Bankhead rather than Buckhead. So if we can get better education for our children and our neighbors over on the west side, if we can get better opportunities for our children and our neighbors on the west side and better exposure, more exposure to things to create uh, higher levels of ambition, higher levels of expectation, higher standards uh, for ourselves and our children to reach, I think that will allow us to not only teach with words, but to be able to have people in my generation set a visual example that can be followed. You know what I mean? You can replicate it, you can scale it, but it's there. You know what I mean? So I think those are the things that, that, that we really, really need to get to our communities uh, as, as quick and fast as possible. Tony, what do you think, especially as it relates to business creation and real estate, right? When we have particular communities, generation after generation, living rental lives, they don't build anything. Again, to what T.I. and Mike just said, um, you know, please understand this is a public and private discussion. As T.I.'s point, you have to improve K-12 education in minority communities. You have to improve to affordable health care. You have to push the public sector, just as you're highlighting, we have to, every meaningful player in the private sector has to lead by example. And becoming more diverse oh, no. and helping in financial literacy is all part of the issue. And, and by the way, people like I and Mike, and please understand, these guys are not just uh, in the musical world. They're supposed to lead by example and are as entrepreneurs. Damn, every NBA player, 80% of the NBA is African American, making over $8 million a year on average. Think of how special each one of those should be the entrepreneur of their community in their post-playing days with just a bit of financial literacy and focus. And believe me, every one of these NBA players has the intelligence, the competence, the ability, and mentorship available to them. And, and truly, being the entrepreneur of your community often does a lot more than sometimes just being uh, the best basketball player in your community. Um. Mike, maybe I'm naive, but COVID exposed so many failures in our society, specifically in our education system and the substandard education so many kids are getting. We're seeing it happen at this very moment. At this very moment, my three kids are in person going to their schools and getting basically the same education they would get any other year. Yeah. We are seeing poor kids in this country, specifically in African American communities, not even get their basic education. Is there a chance that there is a silver lining here, that we're in such a crisis, we can take these ingredients that you're discussing and actually create that change, one that should have happened years ago but didn't? What, what I would like to see happen, I'll tell you about Atlanta. So T.I. and I are both from the west side. Um, the west side um, is an enclave, an African-American enclave. I specifically am from the Collier Heights. is an African-American enclave created by African-Americans for African-Americans. We also know that as 
technology crept up, uh, it got left behind. You know, fiber optic wiring, cell towers, things of that nature. What I would ideally like to see in Atlanta happen, say, in the next 180 days, is you take a company like Figures Wireless, which is, I think, the only black wireless or cell phone company. If you need them to partnership with the bigger company, partnership, but if not, I think they could do it themselves. You get Figures, a contract with city and state, to wire that whole side of town up, which would then take a whole district, a school district named for John Lewis, and it would make it from a from a wireless standpoint um, equivalent to what happens in North Fulton where kids can get on wireless easy so even if kids can't pour back into qualified schools like Frederick Douglass or Jean Child's Young School in the physical what they will have is the proper wireless in their homes a company a company that's in the company to make money but that understands that community needs figures wireless could facilitate that and if the school board and city could find the money to do that that would be an amazing win until those children could then go repopulate a Frederick Douglass High School, which is a big enough school, I think, for 2,000 kids. So not only do you have competent kids coming back that have not missed a step, you would then have a school that opens up, has some financial literacy courses in 11th and 12th grade, and also in the basement would have mechanical drafting like it once did, welding like it once did, and art, where I learned all my financial literacy from an art teacher who owned a funeral home and a bunch of land around the Georgia Dome. Mr. Murray. I'll tell you something else. Mike, I'll tell you what else we could do, Killer Mike. Yes, sir. Why not also take the Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship Absolutely. and make it the best example, the best example in America Absolutely. of how someone as a one-stop shop for both access to capital and mentorship for all minority-owned businesses Absolutely. that grow and use that as a prototype for what every large market in this country should have. And I so having both access to capital and mentorship in one location. And I'd like to say this to cool black people who make a lot of money. Stay in your neighborhoods and help those neighborhoods be better. The Russell Center, started by Herman Russell's legacy is children and more. Herman Russell lived about four streets behind me. Much bigger house, as our house was only about 900 square feet. But his house was the house that we rode our bikes by to look at so that I knew that the opportunity to have something was about four streets behind me if I kept the straight path and followed it. I knew that the opportunity for greatness was right behind me in Billy McKinney's house, in Major Baugh's house. So it was an economically diverse community I lived in, even though it was black. It was economically diverse, and I would like to encourage more people from my community that make it to stay or reinvest in those communities. Um, like Tony was saying, we should be the entrepreneurs in these communities, and we should be re entrifying and not just allowing for gentrifying. Um, I, I, I agree with everything that's being said here. However, I do think that there is an elephant in the room that must be addressed. The curriculum for education comes from the top down, and it's not altruistic at all. Uh, it, 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 it is intentionally uh, doctrinating certain thoughts, ideals, and, and celebration of certain so-called heroes that go directly against the forward-thinking progression of the fair and decent people of America. You know, uh, I think that has to be addressed as well, whether that's a group of us, as we spoke, uh, as we spoke of before offline, a group of us get together and do some sort of a school as, as LeBron did in Cleveland with I Promise, where we create the curriculum, uh, because outside of, you know, just reading, writing and arithmetic, there are other things being taught in the educational system that kills the confidence of young black kids before they can even get started. I think that they're more, uh, there's more time and attention in, in, in public schools spent on how to break the free spirit and the individual thoughts of, of, of of the independent thoughts of a child that comes from that area so they can be put in line once they step outside in, in, into the free world. And you teach them that out, out from celebrating Christopher Columbus as the guy who discovered America to uh, 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 to the, the Georgia history. Who's that guy? Ulysses S. Grant and, you know, all those 
all those white supremacists carved into the side of Stone Mountain. Well, no, Grant's not one of those. That's Grant, a that's yeah, a union yeah, guy? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. my bad. Well, who's yeah, the other yeah. guy? Who's the other guy? What, what we're talk, you're, you're talking Robert, about, like, Robert, Alexander Stevens Was it Robert on Lee side. or something like that? General yeah, Robert Lee? Or, Lee yeah, okay, okay yeah. Well, those guys, those guys. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but if you teach our children... Not that Grant was much better, but... <laughs> okay, got it, got it. <laughs> but, it but, but if you teach our children to celebrate these guys as heroes, Absolutely. then you're essentially telling them that that slavery was deserved. Yeah. You understand? So I think that subconsciously in the psyche of, of, a, of, a, of a child, no less, is, is just as impactful well, and, and as... And I, th I, think that, I think that a cool thing we could do is to start to teach that capitalism even existed there. The people who were owned understood they were property. They understood what they were. But I often used to say to my grandparents, well, how did someone buy themselves out of slavery mm. when they was working for free? Right. But my grandfather, even before I learned this in college, they, they waited to college to tell me this, but my grandfather was like, well, if you had one day off, you had Sundays off. Every white man who had a farm wasn't rich enough to own people. They could rent themselves out to someone else. They understood I am valuable, the uh. skills I have, so you need a fence built, you don't own anyone. I'm going to charge you to build this fence. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to split that with the person that owns me. What? I'll use my savings to not only buy myself out of slavery, to also buy my family. So I just, I just want that said because oftentimes when we speak of being enslaved, we speak from a total place of victimization as though these people had really been regulated to beasts yeah. and they weren't able to think and they were able to think all the way through. And even though they didn't master themselves or their own bodies, they mastered finance as early as being able to accumulate enough wealth to buy themselves out of freedom. And that is a radically different teaching that all Americans should know. True. That, that enters two human beings versus a human being now, making now, someone now, simply a beast. Now, when you say that, I, I, that's definitely a different, is, is viewing it through a different lens. Uh, I think that's kind of, you know, uh, the micro rather than the macro. I, I, I'm trying to say... Um, no, I agree with you. I was just oh, saying, in likewise. addition to the unteaching, but we got to teach that black people been about money a long time. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. We've, been, we've been taking the worst and making the best of it forever. That's absolutely. the same way. That's, that's why trap music is here, because of the crack era. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? The crack era we came. We've made more to, money off rapping about crack than we than and people made, made on crack. crack. You see what I'm saying? So we've always, right, we didn't for we've to go always been making the best of, of a bad situation. But I'm saying, like, as, as Malcolm X taught, uh, anyone who's still depending on their oppressor to educate their children is lost. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You would never in a Jewish community find Jewish parents sending their children to a school that celebrated Hitler and, and praised him as a hero. Absolutely. You just would not do it. However, African Americans or black people, uh, we, 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 we do that every day. And I think that is a huge part of, of, of the cycle that we're in, that we're stuck in when it comes to education. Tony, I want you to help us make the business case of this public-private partnership that it's not just about businesses are so successful, they should give back. Help us understand why it makes sense for business. Look at Atlanta. If, if the city of Atlanta was bigger, stronger, better, smarter, when people came into town to go to Hawks games, they wouldn't be going to the game and then leaving again and going back out to their house in the suburbs. And now, if you invest in communities, in cities, in businesses, everyone will thrive, including that business in top, on top. So it's not just a philanthropic effort. It's a business case. Listen, the private sector should do what they think is both the right thing and good business. And by the way, as T.I. is saying, the private sector should influence a changing curriculum in public education. No question about it. And just as an aside, if you look at Wing today, and I, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but if you look at what we're doing in State Farm Arena right now, Atlanta and Fulton counties had a real problem. It just coincidentally, it's not a coincidence, I don't want to be cynical, you know, African-American communities had three, four, five-hour waits to vote. You come to State Farm Arena, you're in and out. In a private partnership. We're getting over 20% of the voters in Fulton County putting their vote in Fulton County at State Farm Arena. And, and by the way, we have 300 Hawks employees helping that go smoothly. Yes, we are proud of it, but that is a public-private partnership that is making voting go more effectively in Fulton County. That's a good thing. And there's a whole lot of good things that the private sector could influence the public sector to do. 
and it will make for a better country. And it's just well, that, say, that simple to me. Tony, you should be proud of it. And I'll tell you, uh, we are certainly grateful for it because the work that you're doing, TI, Mike, the advocacy and the efforts that you are putting forth is certainly going to help more people rise and it's definitely the next generation. I want to thank all of you for participating today. And of course, as always, I want to thank help John. I want to thank John Hope Bryant. There is no other person in this country taking on income inequality and financial literacy quite like he is. And I'm lucky to know. Thank you guys so, so much. There's thank no you. doubt. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good to see you, Tony. Thank you, guys. Stephanie, thank, thank you. you. Bye, Mike. Yeah, thank you, guys. Love. Tony, love Bye. you, man. Tony, Tony has to be the coolest billionaire I've ever met in my life. <laughs> we need more of those. So, first of, all, first of all, I gotta give some love. Excuse me. What's going Go on, bro? How you doing, man? Long time no love see. Love you, man. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, love. we've been tested for COVID. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks, my pleasure. Absolutely. Everybody, everybody, <laughs> bow to royalty there. Absolutely. Uh, we we all know the great Lisa Borders has been fantastic. It's been a, I mean, it, what a way, great way to close. Drop the mic. I, I love the, I love the quote. We, we've made much more money talking about <laughs> selling crack. Selling, than we ever made selling, selling crack. crack. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And to that point, um, every uh, artist and every professional athlete with a B in front of their name now or next to their name, billions, didn't make it in professional sports or being an artist they made that money when they made that jump to business so they they got their rep they got their rep they got their, their credibility got their good night good cash flow good rep good good net worth in the arts and in professional sports that's called making money mm -hmm. that's called getting paid mm -hmm. uh that it's even getting wealthy but the, i'm sorry getting rich but they got wealthy when they changed their mindset and went from just that to business, and that came from a high level of exposure that you know as, yes. you, as you as you generate this this uh, income, uh, uh, this abundance for yourself. Uh, you, you you begin to get into rooms and create relationships that will allow you exposure to certain other aspects of life that have been kept from you when you were you know on your uh, uh, how could I say ground level yeah. when you're on the ground level grassroots yeah. of your journey. You know what I'm saying? The more you get the more you, 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 you learn, like you kind of, poor people are shut out of rich people's business all the time. Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So oh, the yeah. more you generate wealth or generate income for yourself, then people will start like letting you in to certain secrets and certain things and tools that you could use to get from this level to the next level. It's much easier to become a billionaire from a hundred million than it is from 500,000. Oh, oh, no doubt about it. I mean, and the other side is also true tip if you hang around nine broke people you'll be the tenth that's right yeah whatever you hang around whatever you model you'll be sure right sure. and so we, we I love what you guys are talking about about changing the role modeling in schools but let me let me let me back up here because we have a living icon with us absolutely we've got the last living lieutenant I'm saying this slow so the audience can really well, understand. No, no, there's no, still no. a few more. <laughs> no, the senior lieutenant. He doesn't want to be that. Uh, uh, Dr. King, who is very much, very much alive and engaged. And in fact, I'm trying to slow him down a little bit. Uh, but this man is uh, 130 honorary doctor degrees. Mm. The and only. How many countries? How many countries? How is many that? countries? 130 honorary doctors. 130. 152. 152 countries. Okay. And, and I've been blessed. <laughs> made, really made Atlanta. I've been blessed by my troubles. <laughs> That's right. Uh, really made Atlanta the international city she is today, the only international city in the South. Other mayors have made other contributions, so thanks to everybody. But he's the one who brought the Olympic Games here. That's right. He's the one who brought the international investors here with tens of billions of dollars of investment. Uh, he's the one who really created the environment where it's now the busiest airport in the world. And, and it's the only international city in the South. The only one. One of the top 10 MSAs, economic engines for the whole country. The number one place for black entrepreneurs, business owners, black wealth in the country. Millionaires. We have millionaires. We have problems. We got challenges. We got folks who are 100 heirs who need to become, who need to become thousand heirs and we can make them uh, have a shot at millionaires. But the opportunities there. And, and Atlanta was a city that decided to argue over who got the green, not whether you were black or white. We had a different kind of argument.
And, and I think other folks were backwards and argued over water fountains, and they're still stuck in many of those cities. And they look just like well, they looked 40 years ago. We fought for that, too. Well, we didn't have to fight for it because the business leaders told the public leaders, knock it off. But that was the fight. Well, okay, that, okay, fair enough. We evolved in we evolved. our thinking. There we matured. We all started at that same place, but Atlanta did not stop white there. Folk, white folk like money in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> he, he broke it down. <laughs> in the day. I learned that really early. Like, that, they, uh, they like money a lot more than they didn't like each other. Right? There you go. You know, right. And that's not to say other cities weren't good, but you, you, can, you can get so entrenched on hate that everybody suffers. Because at the time that they were fighting for unions, these guys in Mississippi, and black workers were saying we should deserve our fair pay. The people who were fighting against that, often white workers who worked right next to them, were the most underpaid white men in America. Oh, yeah. And right. Skip Bayless said this during the NFL controversy. Friend if white players would have knelt or stood in solidarity with Kaepernick, if for the first time in at least 50 years would have given the players the proper leverage against the league mm. to negotiate better. Mm. And because they chose not to for the next 20, 30 years, you'll hear baseball and basketball have more secure, better contracts because the NFL has never solved their solidarity problem, meaning they, they dislike some of each other's political things a lot less, a lot more than they like money. Oppression and hate going to keep you poke. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Both sides. You, you, can't, you can't say that again. You, you can't, Oppression you can't, and hate, hate will keep you po. That is a broke man's energy. You can't Everybody. A that's, broke man's energy. You, can't, man you cannot energy. segregate your heart and integrate your pocket. So, so going back to, to you here, Ambassador Young, and really set the stage here, in many ways, we're trying to figure out how do we go from what I call civil rights and movement of racing the color line in the streets to a new movement of civil rights or class and poverty and ownership in the suites. How do we get people today, young people protesting, rightly so, against injustice, to understand they need a business plan and not just an emotional one? They need to re respond, not react. How do you get them from the streets, which is rightly, which is their, their frustrations are rightly so unjustified, to transition to the suites? Well, let me just say that I think of all of you all as my children. <laughs> that Some I've, of them are more troublesome helped, than others. I've <laughs> helped, no, I've helped. No, I told him, he was always Lisa and Andrea's daddy before he was ambassador and Mayor Young. That's right. And, 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 yeah. and Killer Paul. Mike came into my office when he was 15 <laughs> and wanted to put on a conference for young people and didn't want any adults present. He, want, he said, let us talk about our own problems. <laughs> and T.I. and I go back to, well, one of his teachers was a good friend of mine. And she said, I knew that boy was a genius in first grade. <laughs> Say, but he was bad. <laughs> and then John and I have um, sort of grown up together. I'm sort of like, um, his father, yep. after his father went to glory, mm. he sort of got passed on to me. And I tell you what, you all have made me proud in this forum, as in the last year, and as in the work you're doing all the way. But let me go back to my childhood, because I was blessed. And I was blessed because it was a crisis. And by the way, didn't you didn't you didn't you fight in the civil rights movement with her father, Lisa's father? Yeah, grandfather. Okay. Her grandfather. 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 Sorry. Yeah. But um, had to put some age on you. I was I was in sixth grade when Pearl Harbor started, and we did something that I think kids nowadays could do. We realized that America was at war. And we had to find ways to help the war effort. So we started as, as kids, 10 years old, um, picking up coat hangers, getting newspapers, and buying saving stamps mm. and war bonds. Mm. And so I had a savings account uh, with a couple of hundred dollars in it. See, in, a, in elementary school, wow. because the classes competed with each other about how much money we could make on weekends. So I went around the neighborhood collecting everybody's newspapers and selling the newspapers, coat hangers, picking up bottles, see, cutting grass. And because it wasn't just that we were patriotic, it was that the classes were competing against each other. Mm. And I always wanted my class 
to bring the most money to the save us from the war effort and Adolf Hitler. I grew up with the Nazi party on my corner of my house, so Nazism and white supremacy was real to me from three years old, four years old. And my daddy told me, don't get mad, don't let white supremacists get you upset. If you get mad in a fight, you lose the fight. Don't get mad, get smart, see? And you, you're gonna be little all your life. You're never gonna be able to beat up anybody, but if you stay cool, you can think with anybody. And I think that that's what I hope now. I hope we take this crisis as we took the Second World War, as an opportunity to bring the economy. We ended up not only bringing our neighborhood economy up together, but we ended up creating a global economy by 1944 for the entire world. And I see this corona crisis as leading us in that direction. And uh, I think what you're doing, Killer Mike, and I'm helping you, working with you with uh, Greenwood. Greenwood. Uh, but uh, I think we could go to the grammar schools and let the kids start with bank accounts. Yes, sir. That um, Cox cable, whenever it puts cable near a school, it always puts cable in the schools, wherever they are. Now, AT&T and Comcast, if they got a cable line going anywhere near a public school, we need to get them to go ahead and wire up that school mm. so that they can be ready for the virtual future. And by the way, Comcast, who's providing all this infrastructure, has a program where they're giving away computers and internet access to low wealth communities yes. at no cost to them. Yeah. And that needs to be scaled up. We, we, uh, most of us don't even know that program exists, by right. the way. <clears throat> I think but, awareness but, is key. Yeah. And it, it may exist that uh, they have wired some of our elementary schools. I don't know that, but um, that's the kind of thing that helps them make money and do good. Absolutely. Now, educate. The second thing is, education didn't used to cost this much. That my wife got her master's degree at Queens College in New York for sixteen dollars a semester. Mm. But what that meant was. Wow that she was paying taxes on a master's degree salary for the next 60 years, mm. or 40 years. Year. And UCLA used to be $40 a semester when I was in high school. And I almost went to school out there, uh, but I chose Howard University instead because I was the only black person on the campus uh, that summer. And I, I, I felt lonely. But, so I'm saying that we've come a long way, but the way we've gotten here is still an open pathway. Good point. And whenever we make up our minds to do the things that, I mean, you, you had uh, Doug McMillan. The CEO of Walmart. CEO yep. of Walmart. Number one Fortune 500 company, yeah, I believe, now, in the world. But I've been to Bentonville, Arkansas, <laughs> And I saw the little store that he started, that Sam Walton started from. Yep. And so we know that poor people high school education have visions, and they can grow the largest business in the world if they have access to capital. Now our businesses have not had access to capital. Uh, and that's what I think you and Greenwood are trying to do. Absolutely. Make available access to capital. When I became mayor, there was a company that had 1,500 employees, and they couldn't get a line of credit from any bank. Uh, that was just in 1981. And uh, we had redlining in Atlanta until 1989. That's right. And so it, it's, uh, we can change. With all of the things that have been going on, we didn't work on integrating the money hmm. nearly enough. Now, we, we did it in terms of, you know, affirmative action in the construction of the airport. 
minorities got 41 percent of the Olympic money, and everybody agreed to that. But because we had a an Olympics that cost two billion, two and a half billion dollars, another 10 or 15 billion dollars came into Atlanta, and the white community got 90 percent of that. Mm. Uh, because we were able to get 41 percent. Well, if Stephanie been Rule bust, would say, expand the table and add a seat. Money. It, you, 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 what you're saying was, what I'm hearing you saying is, by expanding the economic opportunity, everybody got more. Everybody got much. However, he also said that the, the 10 to 12 billion that came as a result of it, 90 percent of that went the other way, correct? Yeah, that's well, right. I, yeah, but at least, a bit, at least black folks got a billion. Which we didn't have no, before. No, no, see, we it's got a to great get out place of that. to start. No, 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 it's a great place to start. No, but I'm, I'm saying that. You're building on that. that, that okay. building on that. All of us are building on that. Yeah, however, we'd be building from a lot greater place if everything was even as it well, should but be. I'd like to have poverty resolved in the world, too. I'd like for my no, mother to no. like me every day of the year. That ain't happening. <laughs> Let's not. It's, it's not an either okay, or. Okay, we're off topic. Okay. <laughs> it's right. not I'm an sorry. either or. But He's but still bad. It's, it's <laughs> back to what you were saying. It's a, it's a both and. Yeah. It's a both See, and. That, um, well said. You can look at it as the glass is half full or half empty. And I'd rather see us growing. And I'd rather, in fact, we had a song when I was growing up. Accentuate the positive eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Mm. Uh, that, uh, that was a white folk song mm. <laughs> of the say. Andrews sisters. Right. But that became they everybody's... They probably from a brother, so a sister. Everybody's so so the line, but uh, right <laughs> In the Second World War, it, it united the nation. And you all have done that with We Are the World. And I think we've got to find songs that... Uh, you, you, you all have got to rap about money. Oh, I agree. yeah, we don't got no problem with that. I guess, no, you don't have a problem. I'm definitely Andy. This is Hosea. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were three waves to the civil rights but, movement, by the way, right? But by the way, yeah. Ma Malcolm X did come around at the end of his life. No, Malcolm X was always around. Yeah, he actually did want to. He hung Ma around Ma Dr. Malcolm King. Malcolm X just happened to be born, and his father saw his uncle lynched. Mm. and ended up going to jail without much education. Martin Luther King was born rich. Yeah. And his family already had graduate degrees. Yeah. So he, he was born almost with a Ph.D. opportunity. Yeah. But it actually he had took to get both a PhD. of them. It took Martin and, and Malcolm. Malcolm. Yeah. It took both. I'm so glad you said that in an interview earlier this week. I'm so glad that you... you no, it but takes both. I knew Malcolm before I knew Martin. Wow. Because I was living in New York, see... If, from 57 to 61, I didn't come down here to Atlanta until 61. I got to hear that story later. Yeah. One day. Okay. I, gotta, I need to know that one. But uh, this is an opportunity. Yes, sir. Agreed. It's an opportunity to restructure the whole global economy. Agreed. Starting with our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you why. I, when, yeah. when I got the call from Ryan to be a part of I've been helping black banks because that I was just taught much like and that's what you're supposed to do. Yep. My great grandfather's father was used in the Tuskegee experiment. Mm. Between what my gr my great grandparents saved sharecropping and some type of settlement, they bought 33 acres in Tuskegee, which we still have today. We make a modest amount of money, a couple hundred dollars a year for me and my sisters for for, for um, lumber that gets cut off there. But we were taught banking. Right. We were taught finance kind of all the way and to okay. be r responsible for it. So. I, I think that, that what our community has to understand is like my grandfather would often say to me, the worst thing to happen to us is integration. I never understood what he was saying, but he wasn't talking about us physically integrating as much as our dollar. That's right. We allowed the dollar to escape, so we didn't have the cornerstone of capitalism, what it takes. That's right. And that's the economic sphere. That, so by him calling, when Ryan and them called me, I was interested because I'd done all this free work for banks. Right. Mm. I hadn't ever went to a bank and said, you give me a certain amount of percentage off each card, which I could have done. I'm savvy enough right. to say, right. if I go get you a million accounts, give right. me this. I'm, but that wasn't my purpose. Again, I'm the Andy of the crew. Right. I was like, what's going to be better for my community? Right. And when Andy told me about how he had saw paper money in India be used essentially like it was used against poor people here, I get a $200 check, I go in, 
it's 40, it's 20% to cash that check, then I know that all of a sudden it's $160, $40 has been taken out. That's right. Andy had saw a card in India give people a chance to actually keep their money and use their money effectively. And that was a big part of the reason I went with Greenwood because I said on base level, much like my grandparents walked me in to get my first bank account, they bought Coca-Cola and Delta stock for me because those companies were here. Yep. Um, I should have kept them forever, cashed them out at 18, dumb. Like I said, you're just too dumb when you're young. Yeah, yeah, man. And what, what, I, what I understand now is that if I can help a child that's growing up in my neighborhood, same neighborhood I still own real estate, this neighborhood my sisters still are, yep. to understand money at 10, 11, 12, like I understood it, yep. and my grandparents made me pay for half of my first pair of Adidas, if I get that understanding of that kid, then that kid, who's a potential water boy on the side of the street or a shoe cleaner, sneaker cleaner in the mall, grows to have an entrepreneurial mindset. And people think it's always about, I'm making a Madam C.J. Walker, I'm making um, an Alonzo Herndon, but they forget about the 200 people under them that were employed. That's right. Mm -hmm. The 200 families that were enriched, the 200, That's right. the, the four, 600 people that were better educated. I'm here in part, not only because I've had great mentorship and people like Andy or Reverend Young, but um, uh, 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 my family was full of nurses and working class men, and I had one cousin who's like an aunt named June. And being a simple nurse wasn't good enough for her, like everybody else. She went and to got the highest thing. She became an anesthesiologist at the end, just right under a doctor. But she stressed education to her son, my other cousin and I, who grew up right there and told together. So all of us ended up, my, son, my cousin, her son went to Purdue. My other cousin went to Savannah State. I ended up going to Morehouse. And there was this friendly competition between us because of the exposure was right there in my family, the exposure to what money could do. Andy introduced me to what that car did in India. It was there. So I'm a part of Greenwood as an initiative because I know that those lessons aren't given early enough. And as we as an institution can provide that and grow into an institution that has lending and gives capital to black people, I know that, that we stand a chance in this, in this Let me go back to one thing that you were saying about slavery and give you another point of view. Okay. Um, there were 27 black millionaires in Louisiana before the Civil War. Mm. And W.E.B. Du Bois talks about that in Black Reconstruction. But when you really know your black history, you realize that the founding fathers were a very thin layer of very educated and brilliant men. And but all other white women. people weren't like that. That's right. Most of them came from urban areas in Europe that's right. Where they had no education, no understanding of farming. See, the slaves who came here, all of them had been living on the land. Ag agricultural geniuses. Mm -hmm. they, there had been. And not indentured servants. There had been universities in Africa Absolutely. since 1100. Mm. See, long before they were in Europe. Um, if you go back to Egypt, even before the Old Testament, they built the pyramids. Mm. And if you go to Cairo okay, and see who built the pyramids, the Pharaoh who built the pyramids, they don't even have him on the main floor. They have him in a basement. You know black why? Guy. <laughs> He's a short black guy with an afro and a big nose and nice black luscious lips. <laughs> see? And so the p black people who came here as slaves didn't come here with no talent. That's right. That's right. I mean, Frederick Douglass was a slave. And a businessman. But he became a businessman. Business he taught himself to read. Mm. He, he created $16 with the, the Freedmen's Bank with Abraham Lincoln. Yep. And he was one of the leading politicians. He is truly one of our founding fathers. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And so we have never been just victims. No, not the at all. South could not have survived Absolutely. without us knowing how to plant cotton and with uh, George Washington Carver yeah. developing the peanut yeah. and, and the, the sweet potato. The richest city in the as, world as as was eight, is not just Mississippi, 1850. That, that's right. I agree in with all that. I agree with all that. No, I, but I'm, are... I'm saying that the only way we were kept down was through physical violence. Right. right. Physical See, and whenever we accumulated something, they found a way to take it from us. This is true. And uh, that's why you've got to have the politics 
and the economics and the education and the spirituality all coordinated. But you know, A.Y., Ambassador Young, sometimes I think that when, you, when Tip's talking, when T, sometimes it's Tip talking, sometimes it's T.I. talking. And when it's T.I. talking, he's, he's channeling uh, the voice of tens of millions of frustrated people who may not be patient enough to hear, you know, turn the other cheek, whatever the message is. And he's trying to, I think, give them voice in, uh, in their frustrations voice. At the no, same time, sure. Tip, Tip is saying, now, now that said, you can't react to this, you've got to respond. And that and Tips the one that owns the real estate on the west the west side. And, sure, uh, I Tips have, one that I has mean, a multi coach interchangeable. You know, yeah. Ti and Tip and Tip and Ti. I don't. I can't tell them the difference no more. Yeah. But <laughs> I can't tell them apart. But what I'm saying is, either. all these things <laughs> considered, all these things being as true as they are, there is no reason, absolutely no reason, we should sit back and continue to be marginalized and, and, and left out of the financial well, discussion when it is our I, I, efforts that made this country what it yeah, is right exactly. now. So and what I see is what the teacher saw the genius <laughs> in first grade. That's right. <laughs> see? And what John has put together here, and remember Lisa was sort of the one that pulled together the Women's Basketball League. Ooh. President of the uh, WNBA. And, uh, okay. I was my wife did. Yeah. I was like, so President she's, of the Cola she's Foundation. The, women's, the women's Roger Goodell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, we've had what I've seen here just this morning is potentially the answer to not only black people's problems, but to the world's problems. That's right. And it's the coming together of public, private, uh, spiritual, and secular and working together to deal with whatever problems. And, and John, what you've helped us to do is see problems as opportunities. You don't make money till you got a problem. And then whoever figures out how to solve that problem makes the money. <laughs> yes, and uh, there you go. it can be not only at the Frederick Douglass or the John Adams and J Thomas Jefferson was not that good a businessman, but he was a brilliant writer and poet, mm -hmm. see, uh, but um, intellectual. it all c has come together to make a great nation with all of its problems, and this crisis calls us to be the best that we can be, whoever we are, and if we do that and do it together, these problems that we face now become opportunities that create a new future I'm gonna, all I'm, over the globe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my final comments, and I think everybody should say a final comment, then Lisa's going to wrap this up. I think it's been an incredible two days, by the way, so thank everybody for leaning in and being a part of this. I'm getting notes from all around the world, and it's been, been watch parties all around the world. But I'm going to leave my last comments with two pieces of Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young wisdom. And the first one is, and I think it speaks to a lot of what we've been talking about here, Ambassador Young has taught me that in a crisis, everybody has to win. So how do I translate that? Talk without being offensive. Listen without being defensive. Here's a big one now. <laughs> always, and I mean always, leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, They'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable because now it's become personal. You can't even solve the original problem because now they feel rightly or wrongly offended. They feel insulted. Now they might be completely wrong, but now you've stepped on their dignity and now you got to fight. And, and if you just leave everybody with their, find a way, a gracious way to leave people with their dignity and a gracious way out of their own ignorance, they might turn that, that storm into a rainbow because you cannot have a rainbow without a storm First, this leads me to my last piece of Ambassador Young wisdom. I said this at the beginning, I'm going to end it with this. Ambassador Young was running, he was a young man trying to figure out who he was. He was, I think, just going into divinity school. He'll correct me, of course, <laughs> if I get this wrong. And he's, run, he's on this run tip, and he's running up the mountain, down the mountain and up the mountain. And he thought that running and energy was enough to, to work all his frustration. So he's running, he's running, he's running. Think about an angry man. He's running, he's running. He gets there to the top of the mountain. He's exhausted now. 
He's got to stop because he's, he's exhausted. He's out of breath. <laughs> he's forced to sit for a minute with himself. He looks around. <clears throat> he says, sees the clouds have a purpose. The plants have a purpose. The rocks have a purpose. The ground underneath him has a purpose. The birds have a purpose. Everything around him in the quietness of that moment when he's drained of his aggression and his anger and his frustration, when he's at peace, he's communing with God, everything has a purpose. He said, my God, if all that has a purpose, I must have one. I must be valuable. Let me now figure out what my purpose is. If we could help people who are wayward, who are lost, who may be rich but not wealthy. In other words, they got money but they don't have a purpose. Maybe they're making a lot of money. Maybe they're a billionaire, squillionaire, but they, don't, but they feel hollow inside, but they can't admit it to anybody. Maybe we can find a gracious way for some of them to redeem themselves in the eyes of their, whoever they admire, to do good for others. Who knows? I don't know. It's none of my business. That's between them and God. But whoever it is, wherever they are, a good person, bad person, we can find people, give people a gracious way to, towards redemption. I think a saint is a sinner that got up. <laughs> We're all a sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. We've all screwed up yesterday. <laughs> like I said, I love my mother. She didn't like me last today. week. <laughs> today. today. Yeah, let's today. do it. Now, now we're here. Yeah. Let's do it yeah. Yeah. today. Yeah. So today. Let, let's wrap it up, and then, then Lisa will drop the mic. Uh, Killer? Killer Mike? I mean, I'm just happy to be here, John. I'm happy to be here with Andy, you, Lisa, my friend Tip. Um, I, I, I'm just I'm doing what I'm called to do. I really just... Got in this to sing, dance for a living, smoke a little marijuana, go to the blue flame for free. You know, I, I thought my life was going to be pretty simple. I had escaped activism after I, after I left college and got a record deal. And, By the way, you both married, and, right? Very, yeah, we're right both way. married. Yeah. And, and uh, my wife and the she better did. business part of our marriage, who also attends every blue flame occasion with me, that woman is just brilliant. Like I say, her grandmother ran a shot house, so she thought about coin earlier than I did compared to her. My sisters and I were middle class, but what I've learned is that black folks can, we must, we will. I am proud to be a black American. I'm proud of um, going to Frederick Douglass High School because it was there I first heard the term, without struggle there can be no progress. While there, I learned that that was the most photographed man of the 19th century. Meaning, wow. so if you think about Barack Obama, how many times you've seen his picture, that's who Frederick Douglass is comparable to in terms of the spread. And that ain't just popular on the plantations and black communities. So um, through mentorship with people like Andy, James Orange, Alice Johnson, what I've learned is that we're far more a tapestry than we are what we describe sometimes ourselves as a suit, where everybody's just kind of in. Yeah. But a tapestry is something sewn together. And I still have the blankets that my grandmother sold, my great-grandmother sold in my home. And so this country, for me, is a tapestry. It is cooperating. I talk to Tony Rexler as much as I talk to my friend T.I. T.I. Right. Yeah. and I, who sang and danced, um, decided to go into business together. And I hope that at the end of my run that I would have led a, a, a life that he could be proud of for having mentored, that my children can be proud of that my wife will be proud of and that my community will be proud to say I produce. They produce. Hey, hey man. Man on that. Right Tip, on. T.I.? Well, at, a, at 40 years old, <laughs> uh, just turned 40, September 25th, remembering how it felt to be reminded that as a teenager that I was in the percentile of the most likely to fail. Yeah, yeah I used to tell him. Whether <laughs> a lot. The most likely. You know how many times I heard that from 13 to 19? Wow. Man, statistically speaking, you know you probably not going to be here by 21. So have a good run. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's the way the stage was kind of set for yeah. me. You know, whether that was, you know, going to a school and hearing it, uh, the bus driver, neighbors, whomever. So going from that, defying the odds, overcoming adversity in all shapes, forms, and fashions, I believe the first uh, I, I don't think I would have been here if I would not have dropped out of school. Not telling kids to drop out of school. However, I feel that conformity that came with doing it their way would have stopped me from seeing it how to do it my way. And nobody could have taught me through education or anything else, nobody in that, in, in, in that uh, institution could have taught me how to do what I'm doing right now. Well, you're in good company. Okay. Bill Gates. That's right. And 
Ted Turner dropped out. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah. and, and, and Kanye, too, except they dropped out of college. See, I <laughs> dropped out of Douglas High School, you know. And I, uh, But what I'm which saying is, like which mean, was like a college, yeah. absolutely. It was definitely an HBCU. Than that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, uh, making it here against our odds to be here at 40, and on top of that, the BTI. Yeah. That says to me, I can get to be 140. Oh, yeah. And be, you know, and be just as, as, as successful and just as peaceful, just as honest, just as outspoken, just as genuine, just as principled mm. in my wealth as I have been, you know, coming up through the ranks. And I also want to say, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with the opinions of racist, poor white people. Mm. No, I do not. I, they are entitled to their opinions. I have absolutely no problem with it. They are not my problem. If we could find a way, if I could do something to help them get some money, I would. Mm. See, my problem is with the institutional systemic racist, racism that comes from the people who have been put in power, mm. who can use their opinions against my children, your children, your children, to keep us from, you know, allowing our efforts and ingenuity to represent us before the color of our skin. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Those are the, the that's who I have a problem with. Uh, a, a poor white person who can't even do as much for himself uh, as I can, I don't have a problem with that. But if you have someone whose decisions and whose opinions will dictate and determine the pathway of our children and our communities, and, and, and they have uh, an innate, inherent disrespect, disregard for the lives, liberties, heritage, and progression of our people. That's my problem. You, in this particular moment, you, you remind me of me and Ambassador Andrew Young. Me because, <laughs> as I think about your infrastructure, the, the, the young lady who's with you today, the other people I've seen working for you, all of our people are college educated, upset, the people who work for us, who help us move, they're all steeped in education. So yeah, we can do whatever we want because we were a singular you know, whatever, talent or whatever, but everybody can be T.I. and everybody can't be, it, it, literally, me, John O'Brien, but they can be engineers, business sure. managers. Right? So, so that's the scalable model for our people. And if we look at our organizations, they don't run. If a bunch of us run around, run around flossing and glossing, that's right. you need people who can do a balance sheet and run some numbers. That's right. the, the second thing, I don't mean none numbers, I mean business numbers. I don't mean yeah. number numbers. So the, the second the thing, we can write the numbers too. Now, that's <laughs> not getting away. I'm not getting away. I'm not getting away. I'm not getting away. That was actually your father. Hey, for the buses and the buses. I know. Here we go. Here we go. Let's 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 go. And Mark, yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay, okay, we, 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 all right, we, 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 I got it. Down in the middle well, of the city. Right. The second, the second point. We, we are off topic. The, the second so point. Again, the second point. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Kicked out of Degley. The second point is that you remind me of Dr. King and Ambassador Young because Dr. King said I refuse to uh, disobey an unjust law. Yeah. So Dr. King was a was a version of what you're saying. He 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 went there and he got loud. He got noisy. He went and intentionally uh, disobeyed an unjust law to get the attention so that Andrew Young could quiet. He never wanted this man arrested. Mm. Ever. Put, put on a business suit after, after we shut down the economy, after, after, clo after, after the, the sun, go, go cut a deal. Go meet yeah. with the 100 business leaders behind closed door. Get those whites only signs down. Get the, because the business leaders are hurting in their pockets. That's right. So it was a strategy. Right. Set it up and pay it off. Right. That's all I'm saying is we right. need to have a plan and a strategy because anger is not a strategy. Plot, plan, strategize, organize, organize then mobilize. mobilize. Amen. That is not <laughs> just for marching. That is for business. Yeah. That's for how you run your house. Right. That is for everything. Plot, plan, strategize. Plot it out. Think about it. Will it work? Then plan it out yourself. You strategize with other people. Yeah. The people that didn't drop out come yeah. and say, well, this is why that won't work. Or the then people you that did, they just have a gift from then God. You or, <laughs> then you organize, and then you mobilize. That's then right. you send Andy in with a suit to cut the deal. That's, That's it. right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, now, Lisa, oh, what a tough job you had. After all of that. The floor you have. <laughs> <my> <laughs> 
So let me thank everyone, not only this final panel, because we have all been not only educated, but frankly, enlightened. I think by the folks that are here, the generations of knowledge, those who bled, sweated in the feels of what was going on for all these years, and those who continue the struggle, who continue to understand that it's not over, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be over anytime soon. But we all understand that America is a democracy, but it's an experiment. Mm. It's an experiment. It's like a diamond. It's made under pressure. And today, America is in one of those moments when she is under pressure. And she calls on all of her citizens, black, white, whatever, to come in and help. And a house divided, as you said, from Abraham Lincoln, cannot stand. So this moment calls all of us to account. There are no two Americas, there's only one. It is up to us to get our internal struggle together. So we hope, those of you who are watching, that you learned some things today. We hope that we brought inspiration and hope to each and every one of you. To all of our sponsors and everyone who helped make this virtual annual meeting possible, we thank you. This has been more than we could have ever imagined. So on behalf of the board, as well as our founder, chairman, and CEO, please allow us to thank you for being so supportive and for appreciating the work that we're trying to do. Financial literacy, economic empowerment, it's not a black issue, it's not a white issue, it's an American green issue. And we look forward to continuing this work until we work ourselves out of business, because that means the problem has been solved. Get down. Can I? Can Get I, down. Can, next album. <laughs> can I have a closing prayer? Please. Okay. Do whatever you like. And the prayer really is what you were talking about, the realization that I came to on the top of that mountain. It was that the kingdom of God is within you and you and you and you and you and all of those that we meet that we are created in the image and in the plan of the creator of the universe mm -hmm. and the more we go within the better we can do without mm -hmm. And we will see each other as God sees us. Mm. And Jesus, one of his messages was, the kingdom of God is within you. Mm. And so all of the work that you do, however you do it, is an expression of the creativity of the God that created the whole universe. Wow. <laughs> and just like the stars don't bump into each other. Uh, we can learn to get along and each do our duty as the master taught. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Let the amen, church amen, say amen. 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 Everybody, Thank uh, you and God bless. Remember the Hope Global Forum was here. We delivered. Now you must. Everybody remember, one million black business initiative dropped today. Shopify committed $130 million over 10 years, I know you guys missed this, mm. to help set up a million black businesses over 10 years. Okay. They announced that today. Their president, Shopify, is the second largest e-commerce uh, uh, player in the world. Uh, so go to One Million Black Business. Uh, sign up to take your dream all the way up the ladder to reality. It's not only no cost to you, it's an investment in you. So now there's no excuse for you to, to, to double down and make a brand about you. Let's go. All right.
two forty-five is when it would wrap up. So. Thank you.